Bitcoin. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm gonna let everyone file in and then I'll just go over a couple of technical things and then we'll get started. So good evening, thank you for coming. Um, people are starting to join us. So we're using the webinar feature tonight. That means um, you're not gonna be able to speak or see each other, but if you would like to ask questions at the end of the presentation, you'll find a Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you can enter your questions there. We're just gonna wait a few minutes for um, some other people to join us. Okay, so we'll get started in just a minute. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're using a webinar feature tonight, so you won't be able to see or hear each other, but you will be able to ask questions at the end of the presentation by using the Q&A box at the, begin at the bottom of your screen. So if you wanna just take a minute to scroll to the bottom of your screen to locate it, that's where you'll enter your questions. We'll get started in just one minute.
Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Laura Matthews. I'm the Costa Cobb Library Branch Manager. Um, we're using a webinar feature tonight, so please just take a minute to locate the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. That's where you will ask your question. I'm going to start the evening by introducing Alexandra Mock from the Greenwich Conservation Commission. Uh, good evening. I would like to say thank you to Cascap Library for hosting us tonight. And uh, I'm excited to introduce Jay Archer, who is the founder of Green Jay Landscaping, a lifelong outdoorsman, naturalist, and environmental educator, landscape designer, and gardener. Jay, after studying horticulture and design at the New York Botanical Garden, continued his education at Rutgers Center for Urban Ecology. Jay returned to New York Botanical Garden and the Institute for Ecosystem Studies to develop, teach, and lecture in a brand new, one-of-a-kind, ecologically-based curriculum, including wetland, ecological restoration, bioengineering, bio bio stormwater management, landscape construction, and site development using natural earth materials. As, as you can see, the, the list is very long and uh, it makes him perfectly equipped to giving such a beautiful presentation tonight. Um, thank you, Jay, and uh, go ahead. Great, well, thank you, Alexander. And thank you uh, all for uh, your hard work in putting these programs together. Um, I'm in a wonderful position, so my, my world is mostly primitive technology, which I'm suited for, and not so much this advanced technology. But um, I want to thank everybody for their interest in the voice for nature, uh, healing the land and caring for the water uh, through landscape design. And you know, it's a wonderful spring. Uh, every year it's a mystery and uh, a magical and awesome power of nature and the energy of the restorative powers of the natural elements. Uh, nature is kind of a romantic ideal. What we have is we have elements in nature. Um, we have water, air, soil, plants. I think we should all be reminded as, you know, I'm more awful, often speaking to people who are uh, very aware and educated and interested uh, in the environment and improving the environment and our quality of life through taking better care of our landscape environment. And many people do not see it that way. They do not share that. So I'm grateful to be alive and to be witness to the magic and the mystery of nature and the regeneration of the earth every spring. It's interesting, we are coming out of a period where we had four of the wettest years in recorded history consecutively. And this year started out no different and we were anxiously waiting for the trees to start to leaf. So we'd draw up the water from the ground table and lower the uh, water table, and allow that all that surface water to infiltrate into the ground. And it's amazing when you think about how much water the uh, trees uptake and the effect that has. So the hydrologic cycle is obviously very important. It's also good to keep in mind that while the trees are dormant, most of our deciduous trees, which is our predominant um, community uh, environment, is, in the winter they are dormant and they don't they don't uptake uh, carbon and they don't give off oxygen. Particularly, they're inactive. They are not doing much for us. And the reverse is true. Come spring and summer and into an early fall. So we're really dependent on that for oxygenating our atmosphere. And with everything that's going on um, presently in health, uh, one of the biggest challenges is respiratory stress. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to value how important it is to have enough biomass, uh, particularly of nature and native plants to contribute biology to our human health. So we're gonna talk about that. And that said, this is not a 10 step um, 
program on healthy yards or maintaining your landscape. It's about what do we do before we think about how we're going to maintain our landscape environment. And we think about it from a design perspective. What does our landscape presently do? What are the possibilities that the landscape can offer us? So to that end, we think about what we have, what our landscape does in inventory, maybe the plants, and what does it contribute to our quality of life? The most important takeaway from this program that I'd like to impart to you is how important it is to recognize just the fundamental fact that we are entirely dependent on healthy soil and healthy plants to create microbes and microbiomes to create the biofilm that inhabits our skin and our immune system to, um, to make us healthy, to culture the bacteria, the fungi, even the viruses, all those naturally occurring um, parts of biology that inhabit our body, our system, which is a, a tremendously impressive system of filters, you know, our lungs, our kidneys, our, our body, our skin, our eyes, everything. Um, you know, it's meant to clean the air and clean the atmosphere around us. And we have lots of challenges what with plastics in the air and everything else. So that said, um, I encourage you to treat your landscape environment, the immediate landscape environment around your house as if your life depended on it, because it does because most of the other places that we travel in the world, beside our immediate landscape environment, don't serve a lot of ecological function. My car doesn't do much. My house doesn't do much. Um, on and on, golf courses, pools, hardscapes, highways. Think about all the things that don't cre uh, create biological life that we depend on. So that said, what do we do with that? Well, I'm sure you had, you heard Alexander say this before, um, it all starts with the soil. A little different take that I have on this is we do not stop to think of how disturbed our world is in reference to our immediate landscape environment. We have been changing things in our landscape for hundreds of years. Man has changed things thousands of years. In New England, it took thousands of years after the uh, glaciers to create plants that created um, organic matter that became soil. We don't have a lot of it. And then over the last 50 to 100 years, we did some severe damage to it. Synthetic chemicals in the past 50 years have damaged or eliminated a lot of the biology. Compaction has eliminated a lot of air holding capacity, which eliminated or reduced the water holding capacity of that soil. That's very important. So if we wonder why we have pooling or we have stormwater problems or we have drainage problems, we need to look to the soil first. Was the soil is where that water passes through is clean, biologically filtered, it gets down to the aquifer that we depend on for our drinking water and also support life in terms of food and medicine. So first we look in suburbia and we say, what, has, what can we do to improve that? Compost is a, is a good tool, but we also find that we have lots of distress and disturbance and contamination even. In projects we've worked on recently, we've had um, oil sheens from contaminated fill on adjacent properties uh, be apparent in the stormwater. So there's not enough biology to break down those organic uh, components. Uh, petroleum distillates, gas, oil, that's really naturally occurring earth material, but it's concentrated. So if it's not in um, on a high level contamination, we can biologically break it down, but we need the microbes. So to that end, we need to 
inoculate the soil. So in addition to putting down compost to add some organic matter, we sometimes need to add mycorrhizal fungi, we need to add live bacteria, we need to add um, enlivened rock powders like gypsum or green sand and other biostimulants to restore and regenerate from the ground up those important organisms that support life before we put a plant in the ground. Okay, this is why it's very important to eliminate or eradicate uh, contaminants like pesticides. Unfortunately for us, the most damage occurs to the um, landscape environment by homeowners and the landscape industry itself from mowing, from removing leaves, from blowing, from all these things that we do. And that's, that's just, just a fact of life. So we hear a lot of talk about non-native earthworms. We had a great winter because things are cold enough. We're not seeing a, a lot of that evidence. It's early, but we're kind of hopeful that that's had an impact on populations. Um, we need to be aware that soil is very fragile and can run off. So vegetating soil is important. We're gonna give you some examples. Um, we approach things, we wanna create a landscape and design a landscape that is not gonna be built with gas and oil and electric. We're gonna use primitive technology and bioengineering to create the landscape that we want to support life. And we start by regenerating the, all of that life in the soil, then selecting plants that continue to grow that biology below and above ground in layered biomass below and above you know, the surface of the ground. And in this case, we had a steep slope in a small lake community in New York. And over the course of 100 to 200 years, all the soil eroded into the lake. And there was very little left a little compacted soil and you know plants struggling and, and rock. So what we did is it was an opportunity to bring new soil in, to bring engineered soil in. An important thing to note is that when you buy soil locally from a, a vendor, nursery or you know landscape supply place, it's most likely gonna be very high in organic matter because they, what they've done in recent years is they've taken in wood chips and other organic material and mixed it with the soil to produce a composted topsoil. It's very cost effective for them and very efficient for them to do this. Unfortunately, that gives you up to 50% uh, organic matter in your soil, okay? That's really compost soil mix. That means also that compost or that organic matter is gonna break down on a, on a short period of time and leave a void of 25% or so, depending on what the mix is. Also, a lot of native plants and or grasses or certain types of plants ideally don't wanna grow in a high concentration of organic matter. So you have to know what plants are gonna grow in what soil. So in this case, we trucked in um, five truckloads of engineered soil. That's 20 yards or a tractor trailer and had it dumped at the top of the slope. And this is why you see we have these deep trenches, was we had dumped large boulders over a fence at the top of the slope. And these boulders, uh, this is six tons or 20 yards of large stone that was in danger of rolling down the hill and hitting the house or going into the lake or something else. So we had to dig, dig these deep trenches First one trench so that when the boulders rolled down, they would get stuck in the trench. And if they overflowed that, because the pile of stone itself is gonna be pretty high going to the second trench. Some of those boulders we just buried where they were. The rest of them, we moved them by hand. So what you see here is our uh, primitive technology crew um, moving all this material by hand. So once again, it's very quiet, this process. We're not using machines. We were mandated not to use machines. One of the reasons that we got a, a wetland a waiver by the Conservation Board and the Lake Association is we gave them a design and said we had no intention to use machines or gas, electric, oil, 
any of that to a bare minimum, the trucks bring the material in and everything was gonna be done by hand. They were a little disbelieving at first. So we wrote a letter of intent to accompany our design. And a letter of intent was some very sexy ecological language to describe what we're doing. We call this project Shambhala, uh, Lakeside Paradise. And it's not a mystical Tibetan fantasy. It's an actual vacation retreat that our clients spend a lot of time on. Originally, there was a deck where the rake is, and they wanted a place where they can uh, practice the martial arts, their martial arts instructor. So instead, we put in a little no mow lawn that was very friendly to bare feet. And then we created this series of terraces and pathways with predominantly native plants um, so that we can create a beautiful landscape that they can live and breathe in and interact with nature. On the left, you'll see Filtrex socks. They're basically wood chips. So you can buy them uh, filled with wood chips already and then pin them into parts of the slope, plant around them. Over time, they will biodegrade and add mycorrhizal fungi into the soil for further inoculation and stabilize the, the slope. So that's a, a good feature in how to do it. Pathways are very important. And this whole terracing idea, we did it with boulders. We placed selectively, again, by hand in different areas. And we reused all the material we had on site, which we had some wood, like some you'll see some, you see in the lower left-hand corner, some mushrooms coming up out of the wood, some old firewood they weren't gonna use. So we used it to line the path. Once the paths get established, um, then this is gonna be pretty stable. The plants are gonna stabilize most of this. The engineered soil is key. It's 80% minerals and 20% um, organic matter. So it's not too rich. Also, the water will not flow through it too quickly and cause slope failure. That's very important. We also used other soils that had 40% organic matter for the woodland. We took out a decent amount of trees to decrease the competition of less desirable species and to bring in light to get the other more desirable plants to grow. So we did some forestry management thinning um, as part of this. This is playground mulch. Uh, in Connecticut, you can get this at Gregory Sawmill in Georgetown on Route 7. Very, very uh, uniform milled chips. This knits together great for a pathway. It has filter fabric underneath it, but it's really good for pathways. And it's, believe it or not, it's certified for playgrounds. And this is, there's a building code that requires you to do this. It's interesting how the, the slopes themselves are held together by the engineered soil, the combination of boulders, pathways, terracing. Uh, you'll see the low half pent jute, which is a, a hemp netting that will break down by, um, be biodegraded in a short period of time. And the plants are gonna grow, fill that in. Once the roots get established, the jute breaks down. You don't need the mulch really so much and the plants will spread and, and hold on to the slope. We did a series of uh, natural boulder retaining walls, no cement uh, ever. Cement is a carcinogenic product. We try to avoid that. All of this, everything you see here is organic earth source material products, 100% organic. Um, and all manually done. So this is, we had the true test because Ida came the week we finished and we went up to inspect the damage and not one piece of mulch, plant or anything was out of place. This had to pass an inspection by the wetland consultant and the town building inspector who walked through wordlessly in 10 minutes without saying anything to me, got in the car and drove away. So I guess that's success to some degree. It was interesting. Um, here's a thought. We're working on this project today, as it turns out. And here's an example of how you never know what's in the ground until you really start digging around and checking it out. We had some other information was there was engineers involved previously who did some perk testing and actually put in some pipes, um, PVC piping to uh, 
kind of vent piping to determine the water table. We had to wait till the water table went down uh, enough to excavate this. This is a pretty big house and it's got five, five inch gutter leaders that come out onto the lawn in the backyard and just dump it right there. The soil is so compact that I so put in a soil probe, pulled it out, it just sucked. It just, it was just completely full of water. So we brought an excavator and excavated two trench, PVC trench drains leading to the rain garden. We excavated the rain garden and used a combination of sand and gravel in the bottom of the rain garden. And then we, we conditioned the soil. We basically created a new soil mix with the excavated soil. There was all kinds of construction debris three different kinds of clay uh, and basically pond muck that was excavated probably somewhere else, which was anaerobic, not um, oxygen holding. It was really poor soil. So we've used, and we are continuing to use a lot of soil amendments. You know, the gypsum, the green sand, compost, biochar. Uh, a handy thing for you guys to use is if you're not familiar with organic mechanics, um, compost mix. It's up there in Whole Foods in Greenwich. Great stuff for planting. We use their biochar mix uh, commercially, which is just fantastic for our purposes. It, it hosts and inoculates the bacteria, the fungi that we need native plants to uh, start to root in. And this helps establish a community underground of uh, the soil organisms that we need to produce a healthy ecosystem. Also, all of these trenches that are all going to be below ground now are filled in with amended soil and will act as infiltration. So the water will come down from the roof, go into the piping system, but also infiltrate the ground on the way and water the lawn and the plants on the way to the rain garden, it's all directed to the rain garden. So this is a stacked function from permaculture, and it's a technique called uh, passive irrigation. In the meantime, we cut up all the existing irrigation by excavating, you had to prepare it. So sometimes when you're making the sausage, it can be pretty messy. Facultative plants, very important. This is not a wet garden, so this is dry. So what we're doing is we're planting plants that will take inundation and drought, because it's going to dry up and then it's going to get wet. So we pick plants that are gonna tolerate all of that. Um, and then we're gonna put plants like the blue flag iris um, where it's going to be the wettest and, you know, on the edge of shade. Um, so this is some of the techniques that we use. Wetlands. We all live in a wetland. We all live in a watershed. Sheet flow is the water on the surface that comes above from your neighbor to you. Surface water is what is on the top, obviously, and then the aquifer is below. We've had an unbelievably extreme high water table the past couple of years. It didn't go down significantly because we didn't get a lot of hot weather in the past couple of summers. It was great for planting. We've had tremendous success in planting um, and we've been taking advantage of the water, but we're also kind of tired of the rain. But we have to follow the flow paths and see where things go. Cleaning the water, the best opportunity to clean water is not when it's in the water. That's very difficult to do. You wanna clean the water through plants and through the soil and through the marginal plants at the edge. A big mistake that people make is they mow to the edge. Mowing to the edge of water courses doesn't happen in nature. There's a reason for that. The most productive area um, probably in all vegetation is where the water meets the land, that marginal or emergent zone. That's a tremendous benefit to wildlife and it's very important. In my time in Rutgers, we, USDA and NRCS spent a fortune trying to eradicate Phragmites um, as an invasive species. They found out later, nothing cleans, nothing cleans invasive, uh, cleans the water and the dioxin better than Phragmites. Also, you'll see invasive vines along the, the highways, uh, strangling the trees. People say, what can you do about that? Well, I don't think we should remove the vines, even there, though they're killing the trees, because they're sucking up all the hydrocarbons that are produced by the cars 
24 seven. So more things to think about, right? So here it says designing for extreme storms. We design for nature, for life. There's a project called the Secret Garden of Celestial Happiness, because that's what it is. It's predominantly native plants. Um, most of these things are these beautiful native plants. This is July, August, going into the fall, probably, and they're pretty tall. In the early spring, since it's mostly perennials, there's really nothing there. It's flat ground and a few shrubs with the trees in the background. And all of this emerges, you know, miraculously over the course of the season and a succession of bloom, very important to attracting beneficial species. So without continuous bloom of predominantly native plants, you are not going to get that. You are just not going to get the biodiversity that's absolutely key to success in ecological landscaping. So one of the things that we're looking for there is this. So I'm walking around 5.30 this morning in the backyard and you can hear me tromping through the woods a little bit. And I'm always just blown away with or by how much life there is coming to the garden and to the landscape. So this is what it's all about. This is how we understand, are we being successful? Please, whatever you do, do not allow your landscapers to spray mosquitoes and ticks. State doesn't recommend it. Why it's ineffective, ticks flock, ticks um, you know, are under the leaf litter, very hard to kill. That's how they survive so long. Um, in a lawn, they're not there at all because there's no blood for them, so they're, they're not there. Um, They'll be in tall grass and they'll be under the leaves. Uh, mosquitoes, they fly. So I don't know what anybody's doing by spraying them, but all of these pro products are very detrimental to all beneficial life on earth. All the beneficial species are affected. There's present no research and no reason to trust me and believe that, but I find that that's true. So as a byproduct of taking the lawn out in this case and putting in an actual, um, water feature for the birds and ourselves. This is a artificial recirculated stream and waterfall with different heights and depths. And that attracts different species of, of primarily birds at different times. And all of this was underwater. There's fish and frogs and snakes even in there. And my fi the fish here were free because everything here was under two feet of water. As you can see, the, um, the stone, the flagstone, everyone in this neighborhood was under two feet of water. Their basements were flooded, all their belongings out in the street. And then we can say, go back a couple of weeks and this is what happened a couple of weeks later. So there was a film from the 22 acre, very polluted wetland that uh, butts the property and the sediment that was suspended two feet in the air, stuck to a lot of the plant leaves and created a film on the leaves and vegetation, kind of discoloring it. Couldn't really wash it off, it was so sticky uh, with pond muck and there was petroleum distillates. There was, there was oil in, in the backyard, all over the plants. And within a couple of weeks and a couple of months, you couldn't tell this event ever happened. So by doing ecological landscaping predominantly with native plants that are producing all the things intended for us to cultivate in our bodies, this will also withstand a tremendous amount of natural storm events. Here's an example where um, we are doing a floodplain plane planting and we'll use trees, shrubs, seed, um, conservation seed from Ernst Conservation. These are plugs from North Creek Nursery. Um, we plant many plugs because they come in 50 or 35 trays. So we'll plant, you know, say a thousand at a time or something, expect half of them to live. If we're lucky, we'll get 60% maybe. So while they're, they're cost effective, 
but in that they're cheap for the plugs, some of them will just not thrive and some of them will take off and you won't know until you plant them. That depends on what time of year it is. It gets pretty complicated when you're trying to select plants that are perfect for given hydrology, sunlight, soil conditions, and what you're trying to do to compose uh, and biomimic nature. Uh, remember, there's no such thing as nature. It's a myth. So we're kind of making this up as we go along. But take risks and don't be afraid to fail. Was anything's better than what we're doing now? So yes, you can create habitats. We can't get hung up on native plants as opposed to invasive species. You have to ask yourself, what are invasive species? Why are they there? Well, they're creating, you know, they may be serving an ecosystem function. Uh, so while we think native plants, great, native plants, here's, here's coneflower with black-eyed Susan. Coneflower is native to the Midwest, but now we accept that as a native plant in the East. So let's not get too picky. There's lots of varieties, native, native ours, cultivars. We need more diversity. So plant more plants and all plants that flower attract pollinators, but it's important to get the succession, right? So that's what we're looking for. At least in the small plot of land that I have. This is about people. It's not really about the work that we do. It's about how it affects people. You get one planet and everybody has to share. It's about the life that the garden brings to the earth. You plant things for pollinators that pollinate the garden. These are real people and advocates for the environment. They're not just clients. So again, native versus non-native. We have all kinds of plants that were existing in a landscape. We didn't go to ground zero, throw everything out. We compose the landscape, try to repurpose and recycle what we have. We also identify things that are gonna prohibit other plants from growing. Uh, Facithia doesn't serve any good purpose for us. Garlic mustard, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's a native wildflower, but it does tend to sterilize the ground. Rhododendrons, if you have a, a well-drained slope, maybe you consider that native. If you think about what used to be native here, we were surrounded by chestnut trees. We were surrounded by elm trees. We had all kinds of dogwoods and things going. The dogwoods are, are dying. It's hard to get them in nurseries. No such thing as chestnuts. They can't successfully grow them. We're losing all the ash trees now. Uh, it's too wet. It's too hot. Uh, spruce, getting too hot, too wet for that. A lot of plants in the last four years didn't want to be in a rainforest. So um, we have to be aware of what's going on and work with what we have. And, you know, more hummingbirds. It just can't get enough of the hummingbirds. All of this is an example of obviously no lawns. The lawn is the most highest maintenance intensive thing. So what do we do? We murder the lawn by cutting it at two inches. It's shocked like it has a heart attack. Then we get the paddles, we wake it up and we fertilize it and we put more water on it, a lot of resource expense. Then we go and we do it again, give it a heart attack the next week, cut it down to two inches, repeat the process and expect the same results <coughs> continuously. And it does nothing for us ecologically. So in any case, these are all examples of completely high functioning ecosystems that can support life for your body. We can't save the planet. This helps and contributes to that, but we can save your life. You can save your life and you know, prohibit pr premature aging and a better quality of life physically, biologically, mentally, spiritually, by having landscapes that reflect nature instead of reflect our suburban sterile ecosystems. Permaculture, stack functions, we talk about it all the time. Your, your landscape should do many things. And, you know, grow your own food with compost now. Whoa, organic food is expensive to begin with. Not everybody can do this. So, I guess we should start growing our own food if it gets any more expensive. Responsible land stewardship. <clears throat> right now we encourage people with over five acres of land to invite us to work with them. 
on a uh, sustainable stewardship program. So we could develop a landscape and do forestry management, maybe get controlled hunting going on, which is the best way to manage the deer population. Also, that's another subject for another time. If you do not do something to manage the deer, you're gonna have a problem, right? So permaculture terrace garden, everything here was done by hand, all natural source materials, water bars, natural stone. Um, each one of the zones, this is a true permaculture thing. So they're growing herbs and berries and food all over the place. Unbelievable amount of bees and wildlife. They don't even have a deer fence here, believe it or not. And this is humongously productive and biologically regenerative for their own health and serenity and peace of mind. And plus they're, they're eating it. It's a, it's a lot of fun stuff. So in any case, that's a little taste of natural landscaping. So I uh, thank you very much and I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. Oh, and one last thought, okay? Do appreciate and love the world despite the pain and suffering that the world feels. Um, Joanna Macy um, put it best in a wild love for the world and the work that reconnects. So please cherish, nurture, and conserve and protect our precious natural resources for our children and our children's children. So thank you very much. Okay, so we have one question. Um, it looks like someone would like to know if there's a local source of 50 pound bags of sodium bentonite clay for containing water in a rain garden? Okay, that's a good question. Let's see. I Last I bought sodium bentonite um, clay might've been from Apgar in Danbury, Apgar Sales or Mill River in New York. Um, it's not very popular, but you know, you probably, if you search online, you probably get it. I would not use it in a rain garden, okay? It's, we, our application for it is we would mix it with heavy clay, which we just used it actually last month. Um, we had a dam that was constructed and because of high water eroded a bank next to the dam. So we took impervious clay fill that we bought in Lord and Adams construction and, in, and mixed in uh, sodium bentonite the expandable uh, clay. And then we made a watertight clay, um, impervious clay barrier with that. It's really not for rain gardens was it potentially could hold too much water. So rain gardens, biochar is much more useful for that because it will hold on to the water, but it will release the water. A rain garden, you also wanna, a rain garden is a very generic term. So there's there an outflow, is there inflow, it could be, you know, somewhat complicated, but I, I wouldn't recommend that product for a rain garden per se. Okay, and it looks like um, another question is, how can I start small and what should I plant first? Well, I hate this answer. That depends, okay. Uh, how many lectures have I sat through where somebody said that depends? So what is the area you're talking about. And when you say start small, small results are what you're gonna get. So pick an area that will at least produce some kind of result and amend the soil probably, uh, at least with compost, but also dig it up, examine it. Is it heavy clay? Is it sandy? Do you need to hold water? Do you need not to hold water? Do you need to improve the texture of that? the um, actual physical consistency of that soil. Do you need more organic matter? Probably, because the organic matter is broken down by removing leaves and you know everything else. Um, plant masses of plants if you can when you're starting off. Don't plant one lonely like Black Eyed Susan or something. Give it brothers and sisters. Plant, th there was a myth of plant communities where plants would grow in like masses. Uh, they don't exactly do that in nature. They kind of like float around and they self seed. So you'll have a group here, one single over here, two over there. So that can happen naturally. You can design it that way. It really, it's what your intention is. So sit down and think about 
what you want it to look like was landscaping is art. You can't make this any more complicated because we're already thinking about physical engineering, bioengineering, horticulture, organic horticulture, because most of the horticulture that they taught us in school is everything's a problem. It's a disease or a pest. We have to kill it. We have to stop killing things and start growing life. So that's a different departure. Then the ecological part above it is we need things to plants to do things. What are they going to attract? What species are they going to attract? And when is that going to happen? So when is that going to bloom and what is that going to attract? I kind of want to know that. Um, also, it should look beautiful. And that's the artistic subjective thing. Another question, should we be removing the English ivies on the trees and ground cover? And that's a little bit of background. Our gardener used chemicals on the lawn. We want to change it into a pollinator path. Is this possible? Of course, anything's possible. There's no magic wand. I can't just do this. You need to put the work in. People call me to say, you know, I want to get rid of my lawn and I want to have no maintenance. Well, gee, I don't know what to do with that. I, you, we should want to maintain our properties. We should want the garden. Was putting your hands in the dirt is where you're going to get the microbes to inhabit your biofilm. That's going to make you healthier. Um, but first of all, English ivy to me is, it's not totally benign but it's not a huge threat to civilization. So if you have it in an area, it's, it's not probably not gonna strangle trees. And you know, it's probably not destroying your house or anything else like that. So if it's not offending somebody's like sensibilities, is it like some evil, you know, horticultural disposition? No, no. And that's what I mean about, look at the existing and saying, what should be improved? What can I live with? What are you, you know, what is important? Yeah, um, Portland, Oregon is called the Emerald City. Why? A lot of ivy, a lot of green stuff growing. Uh, they have the climate for it. Is it terrible? No, it's not terrible. Is it the best thing? No. I'm driving down the road and I see purple trees on the highway yesterday going to Greenwich for dinner. Oh, wow. I used to think they were purple trees. Well, no, they're wisteria. Why is the wisteria growing? Oh, they get phosphorus probably from the hydrocarbons. Was when you want wisteria to grow, it takes two things to do Chinese wisteria. You beat it with a stick, it likes disturbance, and you feed it with um, triple phosphate, and that makes it bloom. It seems to get that from the highway. It's, they're not trees, it's wisteria growing, you know, escaped onto the wild. Is that a bad thing? I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty. Um, would you, what do you recommend as an organic way to get rid of Japanese knotweed? Japanese knotweed. Oh boy. Thank you very much. You got any more fun questions like this? Um, <laughs> so we just did this. Um, we had a client that, um, you're not going to like this, but this is, this is what happens. We had a client that's been spraying it for I don't know how many years. And we wanted to do, we did, we wanted to do an, a native plant uh, landscape right there. So we excavated it to a depth of five and a half feet. So we dug it up, put it in a truck, carted to a you know certified landfill that would take this demon child and dispose of it. Um, it's one of the absolute worst, most challenging things. If you can, you excavate it six feet in the ground, put a permanent barrier between that and the constructed soil you put above it. I would put structural soil above that in layers and then, you know, some filter fabric and then layer on top of that. This is not for the faint hearted and it's not an easy, cheap solution. So um, I'm not saying abandon all hope, but also look at why is it there? What has caused the contamination? Was that really looks, a lot of, a lot of these invasive species pop up because of poor soil conditions and because of contamination. So what, before you start removing that, or do you still, will you still have the contaminants, the pollutants that caused that problem in the first place? So this is why soil remediation is very important. Um, what was the product you mentioned as at Whole Foods? Whole Foods, they have these big white bags of uh, organic mechanics uh, compost. It's a very high quality compost. They also have a planting mix. We have, used to have to go to, what is that real shishi place in uh, Westport? 
Oh, terrain. I love terrain. Terrain's cool. Uh, we used to have to go all the way up there to get organic mechanics, but now it's at all the Whole Foods. So that's a plug for um, Mark Highland, and we love them. They have great products. They have some stormwater products. Um, Mark, where is my commission for organic uh, mechanics? Great stuff. We use the biochar. We buy it by the pallet. We use a lot of it. A little biochar goes a long way, but it's revolutionized growing food and everything in America. Most of the high-tech um, biostimulants and biology that we use for soil remediation to grow native plant landscapes on the highest scale actually is intercepted on the way to the cannabis growers. Okay, the cannabis growers get all the good stuff because there's real money in that. Do you have any ideas for ground cover to replace Pachysandra? Anything, anything is better than Pachysandra. You know, Pachysandra does not offend me. You know, uh, Allegheny, the uh, native Pachysandra is kind of interesting. It's not evergreen. We were down in Mount Cuba in the beginning of the spring and it's coming up very early and, and it's cute, um, but it doesn't do what Pachysandra does. We just did a steep slope <clears throat> two days ago where we ripped out some of the Pachysandra and some of the Vinca on extremely steep slope and then put some logs, pin some logs in there, put some jute netting in there and planted shrubs and grasses who are gonna root deeply with deep roots. One of, the, excuse me, one of the things that we're looking for on slopes is things that will root deeply. So they will have biomass below and above the ground but particularly deep root structures. That's why junipers are so effective and to hold and stabilize the slope. If you're on flat ground and you have Pachysandra, you could remove it with like an edger or a curved edge or a shovel even. You could roll it up like a carpet. It's really cool. And give it to your neighbors, uh, like your neighbors on the other side of town, you know, in a truck, just like roll it up like a carpet. And then uh, there's, you know, there's lots of native things like Tiarella. I like, um, you know, foam flower. Um, and we also use a Juga, Sweet Woodruff, and things that are not native in combination with uh, other things. You know, how long do you have to be in, in, in this country to be naturalized? We use daffodils and tulips for spring color because there's not a lot native for early spring and for pollinators too. And a lot of, a lot of flowering plants, you know, they say that, you know, pollinators not interested. You see plants that flower. In the spring, you'll see a lot of non-native plants in the United States and a lot of bees. Thank God for the cherry trees. Right. Thank God for the apples. Thank God for, you know, so many things that we see. And that's for early pollinators. So there's a ton of, of ground covers. Look for natives. But I like combinations of things because things bloom at different times. So if you have a flat area, it's, a, it's much more forgiving. Is it shady? You want to make sure you're using shade plants. There's a lot of good uh, plant lists. Be careful. Some of them may not be appropriate for your area. Some of these native plant lists or the echo regions could be at 2000 feet. So, you know, make sure you, you kind of do a little bit more homework. If you're looking for easy, nothing's easy. Nothing worth doing is easy. You got to put some effort into it. But there's lots and lots of fun stuff you can do. Oh, Mazda's reptans I have in my walk. I love that. Jeez, Lord, I apologize. That's not native either. But you want to see it today, Bloom. Wow, that's fantastic. And Creeping Jenny, not native, but naturalized in wetlands all over the place. Been here for 100 years. Yeah. And um, how would you enrich a vegetable garden? Vegetable gardens are a little bit more unique, okay? Because you're growing food. And in this case, you want um, good drainage. So is it a raised garden? What they mostly are, right? So if you have a raised garden, um, then you could use, you know, a, a good compost. You might want to mix compost with topsoil. You might, might want to mix it with sand. Is there a native soil component? Uh, is it flat? If it's flat, you'll really want to fluff it up. So like, that's why people turn over vegetable gardens because you're planting annual plants. They really need air holding capacity. So it's not just a medium, but it's also that water and air holding capacity. You want moist, well-drained soil. Good luck with that. 
So that's where sometimes we use sand and or green sand. And um, well, so you wanna check pHs on a vegetable garden. Get a pH bead or a simple Sudbury test. You wanna find out, usually most of our soils here in the Northeast and soils that you would buy even and compost that you would buy bagged or whatever are gonna be in the neutral range from six to seven. If you're planting blueberries, plant them in one hedge. And that's the only time we use peat moss because blueberries wanna be at a pH of five to five to six. So do your hydrangea, most of your hydrangea. So if you want your hydrangea to be blue instead of pink, for instance, you know, you're gonna to wanna to feed them elemental sulfur if you you know, your pH is naturally around six, which it usually is. So we feed hydrangea and blueberries and other acid loving plants twice a year with the acid, you know, organic fertilizer, which just means it's got some elemental sulfur instead of aluminum sulfate, which is, you know, a heavy metal. But uh, vegetable gardens, you can buy a great planting mix, actually, not to be obtuse, from Costa Maine. Costa Maine's all over there. That's the highest grade, like marine, um, marine mineral compost stuff. So they have one that's great for blueberries. Um, they have uh, several varieties of stuff. Uh, we're using like a, a Patagonian frog compost. It, the label is frog, so I don't know what it is, but it's got back guano and bird, you know, fertilizer. I think that's going to be real important now with synthetic fertilizers anyway, becoming less available, more expensive. So there are some very cool things out there and you don't experiment and it really depends on your site. There's no two landscapes that are the same. They're like us, they're, you know, they're like snowflakes. So look at your, the uniqueness of your situation and question and say, okay, how have I done so far? Should I add a little bit more compost? Turn it over, get a lot of air capacity in there. If you got heavy clay, you got to amend it, you know, and maybe just, you know, add a little bit of sand if you wanted to increase the drainage. Okay, so that was the last question, unless um, anybody else wants to add a question now. Great. You could always reach me by email too at greenjlandscaping uh, at gmail.com. Okay. That looks like that wraps it up. So thank you so much. A lot of good questions. Um, that was very interesting. We're so glad you joined us. Great. Thank you very much. Have and everybody should go have fun now in the, yeah. in the garden. Good evening, everyone.